That would be great. Um, and uh, so uh, I just don't like, I, I don't like wearing dirty clothes. I'm sure that you don't. I don't want to wear dirty underwear or, or I, I don't want to get up. I don't want to have a dirty suit on or a collar that's got a lot of dirt around the neck and all of that. I'm sure you, you feel the same way. Uh, I mean, if, if my wife, you know, if I came in, I took my dirty clothes off, put them in the dirty clothes bag, and, and uh, my wife just took them out of the dirty clothes bag, put them back in my drawer, got up the next morning, put it on. You know, that wouldn't be good. I'm really thankful. My wife is the queen of clean. She is the queen clean. If you come to our house, everything, y'all over the house on Thursday, uh, everything has a place, everything is in order, everything is clean. She washes clothes every day. There's just two of us, and we don't wear that many clothes, but she keeps uh, towels and, and uh, dish rags and the whole nine yard. Uh, she, she, she really, and my children, I have to say that all three of my children are clean freaks as well. Uh, my two sons, my daughter, they're all, they're all, they're all sort of clean freaks. Um, and she taught them really well. So I don't like wearing dirty clothes at all. Every night when I get ready for bed, I, I go, I take my clothes off, I put my pajamas on, I put the dirty clothes in the dirty clothes bag, and uh, I put my, burton, my button up shirts in a bag. I take them down to Warnerke cleaners and let them dry clean them. Um, I don't wear a suit over twice. Oh, this is probably the second time I wore this suit, and I'll put it in the bag, take it down to morning cleaners, because I just don't like I don't like dirty clothes. And I have a really dirty truck, and you're going to say, "Well, what's the difference, Gary?" But uh, the the clothes are are, are different, and so uh, the most part, my wife washes all of our dirty clothes every day, and she may miss a day here and there, but it's very seldom. So every day, I get to put on nice, fresh, clean clothes. Every day. I get to do this. I did it today. I'll do it tomorrow. We have some guests, uh, another pastor that's from Alabama that's going to spend the night with us tonight. He and uh, his wife, they lived above us when we were in the seminary in Texas. And, and uh, uh, they're going to come and, and spend uh, uh, the evening with us. But what about your spiritual clothes? If somebody were to, to talk to you about what you displayed in your life and what your spiritual clothes were like, I wonder what it is that you would actually say to them. The scriptures say that there are certain attributes, and it's used multiple times in the scripture. We'll look at a couple places, several places this morning where it's addressed, where God tells us that there are things that you are to put off, and correspondingly, there are things that you are to put on. He's going to say, I want you to put this off. I want you to take this off. I want you to get rid of this out of your life, and in its place, I want you to replace it with something else, and he'll tell us what those things are. Think of what God wants you to put off. I want you to think of it this way all day. As we go through this message, I, I want you to think as what you God wants you to put off as dirty clothes. Just, just something that you're familiar with, something that you don't like to wear. Nobody here today has got on dirty clothes, which I'm really grateful for. And I want you to think of when God tells you to put something on, that what he's telling you is that I want you to put on some clean clothes. I want you to look nice when you go out and you go to the restaurant, go go out to eat today, and I, I want you to put on some clean clothes. I want you to, to display me properly. I want you uh, with the attributes, that uh, qualities that we're going to talk about. So we take our dirty clothes off, we put clean clothes on. That's a, that's a good picture, right? Everybody, everybody here can understand that picture. We do it every day. It's normal to us. It's something that we understand. And I think what God is saying, he said, I want you to, this idea of you putting on, take, uh, of putting off dirty clothes in your life, dirty spiritual things in your life, and putting on uh, clean, clean clothes, I want you to think of it this way, 
as the dirty things that you take off of yours, the clean things that you put on are God's. When you put on an attribute, when you put on a certain quality from God, that, that's what you want to do. You want to display God in, in, your, in your life. So when you know that there's something in your life that is contrary it's contrary to what God would want you to do, all of us, every single one of us have to deal with that in our life at different times, but uh, when you know that there's something in your life, maybe you're unkind to people, maybe you're just short with people and just short-tempered, and maybe you, your, your speech is a, little, is a little inappropriate at times, uh, whatever it may be, God wants you to put it off, right? And so what you want to do when you know that that is in your life is that you immediately... And this is the key word. You immediately want to develop a mindset. We talked about the mindset, the different kinds of mindsets that we can have. You want you want to uh, have a mind. You want your mindset to immediately be, "Hey, I have to take this off, and I have to put on what God wants me to wear, what God mm -hmm. wants me to display." I, I'm wearing some dirty clothes today. I'm not acting the way that God wants me to act, and. He wants me to take that off and he wants me to put on the way that he wants me to respond. Uh, so both putting on and putting off, listen, I want you to, if you're taking notes, write this down. The putting off and the putting on are intentional decisions. You don't just do it by accident. Nobody grows spiritually by accident. You intentionally decide, make a decision that I am not going to live that way. I'm not going to act that way. And it requires a particular mindset for you to be able to do that. You have to build a neural pathway. We'll be talking more about the neural pathways uh, in the weeks to come, but you have to build this neural pathway in your mind. That's the way that God has designed you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. That's the way that you're brain physically operates is that you if you if, if there's something that you know that you're not doing that you need to do you have to build a neural pathway a mindset a godly mindset that you can work from that you can build on in your life and you reinforce it with the right thinking to achieve this now i want you to look in colossians chapter 3 with me and i want to read i want to read uh three verses beginning with verse 8 it says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these. I'm in the New King James, if you have a different version. But now you yourselves are to put off all these. Now, it, let's just, you don't have to do this, but the way that I want you to think about that, you could read it like this, but now you yourselves are to put off all these. I'm to put off my dirty clothes. I'm to put off my dirty clothes. And then he gives us a list of what they are. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the dirty clothes. I'm adding that of the old man with his deeds. His deeds are what? What are his deeds? They're the dirty clothes, right? The anger, the wrath, the malice, uh, the blasphemy, all of that. And you have put on, what are you going to put on? You're going to put on God's clothes. You're going to put on God's attributes. And we'll go through some lists today of what they are. You put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Now, I want to say something to you just from a, uh, just from a hermeneutical perspective, okay? That whenever you come to a list in the scriptures, Whatever it may be, any kind of list that you come to, you might just think initially say about the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know, blessed are the meek. Uh, um, it's a list. There's eight qualities that are there. Every list in Scripture is very, very critical. You want you want to have a mindset about what a list what a list is and why a list has been given to you. When you come to a, a list in scripture, here's what you need to do. Everybody's got a car, right? Everybody's got a truck. When we go, when we get in the, get in the car and we go somewhere to eat and, and, uh, 
and we stop and we pull up into the uh, parking space, we put it in park. And that's exactly what I want you to do when you get to a list. I want you to park there for a little bit because there's a lot of content. There's a lot of meat that is in that list. What God is doing this is the way that you would define it hermeneutically is that God is consolidating his truth for you. Rather than it being spread out, rather than it being in multiple places, he's put his truth, he's consolidated it into a list so that you don't have any doubt about what it is that he wants you to do. He puts everything in one place so there's no mistake about what it is that he is actually talking about. In this passage, in Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 8, God says that you're to put off certain things. Let's go over them again. You're to put off your anger. I've told you this story many times. You know that it's accurate and true, but probably 35 years ago, uh, God dealt with me uh, about anger. Uh, I didn't get angry very often, but uh, normally when I did, I'd be angry at my wife or I'd be angry at my children. And every time I would get angry, I would say something that I regretted saying, right? You ever been angry? You ever said the wrong thing? My tongue, I just couldn't control it. And God told me, literally, I, in, I mean, not in a literal way, but just the Spirit of God dealt with me. And I had the impression that what God was telling me was that, Gary, if you don't, if you don't get a control over your anger, I can't use you. I don't want you to be standing in the pulpit and be somebody that's always angry. You get frustrated, you get irritated at people. They arouse your anger. You say things that you don't want to say. You'll speak your mind, whatever it may be. God says, I want you to get rid of anger. And he, he dealt with me. I, I put it off. And for those 35 years, I may have been irritated. I may have gotten frustrated. For those 35 years, I've never been angry since. I put it off. I took off those dirty clothes and I, I just don't, I don't get angry. You can ask my wife, you can ask my children, you can ask my friends. Uh, you've never seen me angry. Uh, I don't, uh, you've seen me frustrated as a church, right? But you, you've never, I don't think you've ever seen me angry. I know you haven't. Um, the next term was uh, wrath. That is, uh, that is a different aspect of anger. It, you could actually use the word rage and maybe some of the translations that have it that way. Malice. Malice is when you have bad feelings towards somebody else. You don't like them. You, you don't get along with them. They're not, you don't, you just don't like them that much. So you have these bad feelings toward them. Blasphemy is uh, verbal abuse and slander. It's uh, when you uh, blaspheme against God, against God's word, you reject it, uh, you speak against it, filthy language, which is cursing. Uh, I don't curse. Uh, before I was saved, I, I, I cursed, but I've been a Christian for nearly 51 years. I don't, uh, over 51 years, I don't, I don't curse. You don't, you're not going to hear me curse. I, I put that off. Everything that I did before, I just put, I put it off. You've done the same. Uh, and then he talks about lying. So you could just as easily, I want you to turn, if you would, uh, turn back a few pages to Galatians chapter 5. And we went over a lot of this, not all of them in, in detail, when we uh, uh, taught on Galatians uh, a couple years, several years ago. But I want you to read this list with me. This is a list, right? So what do you do when you get to a list? Everybody tell me, what do you do when you get to a list? You park. You stop. The list is important. There's several lists in this pa in this passage. Uh, there's the bad things, and then there, there are some good things. We're going to read the bad things first. This this list is very complete. It's much longer than the one that we read. I'm not going to go over all these. I'm just going to read them. Now, the works of the flesh, beginning verse 19, are evident. What are these? Everything that we're going to read here, we would call them what today? Dirty clothes. Say it out loud. Dirty, dirty clothes. clothes. We're going to call them our dirty clothes. So if you don't like wearing dirty clothes physically, you ought to hate wearing dirty clothes spiritually, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got adultery, uh, fornication, uncleanness. These are, these are, this, this list is, is, a, is a bad list. Lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. That's the Greek word pharmakia, and it has to do with drugs. Uh, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, 
selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell who? Read it. Of which I tell you. One of the, one of the premises of this Bible study or this series that we're doing is that I'm using the second person plural, right? Or the second person singular, which is what? You, you right? Be why? Because the Bible is always talking to who? You. It's talking to me. It's not, I don't read the Bible for my wife. I read the Bible for me. It's talking to you. And he says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you see somebody that has, uh, is pro you know, these qualities are, are prolific in their life, they're there all the time, it's, it's habitual, it's telling you something about that person. They have a lot of dirty clothes on. They have a lot of dirty clothes, and those dirty clothes uh, need, to, need, need to be put off. So spiritually, I want you to think of all of that's in this list as your dirty clothes that God wants you to put off. If any, let's just say, for instance, you read this, you're reading this list, hopefully, hopefully it wouldn't apply to you, but let's just say that it does. Let's say maybe you had a bad day yesterday and, and you had a fit of rage. You, had, you, you got really mad at somebody and you said something that you shouldn't have said to them. So if any of these negative qualities are in your life, what does God want you to do with them? He wants you to put them off. He wants you to take them off, and he wants you to put on his spiritual qualities, which we will look at. So this is as clear as it possibly could be. When you read a list like this, everybody listen to me. Everybody look up here for a minute. When you read a list like this, you have to read it in such a way that you realize that God is speaking directly to you. It's not that so-and-so, you know, Brother Bob and Brother Bill and Sister Grace and Lily, that they've got these qualities in their life. Don't worry about them. This is written to you. If you read this and you can tell in any of this list here that there are things that are it, that that would refer to your life, God wants you to put them away. So these are verses that you must pay attention to. Why have why do you want to pay attention to a list like this? It's because in a very simple way it reveals what is wrong about your life, right? It, 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 it reveals that this area of your life is not right before God. And it's having a negative impact. It's having an impact on the people that you meet, the people that you see and talk with, people that you work with, your family, your children, whoever it may be. You have on some dirty clothes and you're getting the other people around you dirty at the same time. If I came in here today and I had mud all over my suit and and you know, uh, it was dirty and you could tell that and I went to hug you, you'd probably back off, right? Because you wouldn't want to get all that dirt on you. And so what I'm trying to do, if you'll let me do it as your pastor, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to literally push you out of your spiritual comfort zone, out of your, your Christian cocoon that you live in, that, uh, that you, you just may be, you, you read verses like this or any, any of the lists that you read and it, you don't apply it. You don't read it right. You don't read it properly. And you just get into your comfort zone. We, we, we've already talked about getting out of our comfort zone and, and that we have to become comfortable being uncomfortable because God's word is always going to make us uncomfortable. If every time I sat down and I read the word and it just made me feel really comfortable, I probably wouldn't be reading it right. We had a great Bible study yesterday. James did a, a marvelous job. And uh, I, I was reading, I mean, I was meditating on that as, even as he was uh, teaching and talking. And, 
And I, Lord, these are, this is what I want in my life. This is what I want to be taking place in my life. So God is going to challenge you in areas in which you know that you need to be growing, but you're not growing. Now, let's just say, for instance, that right now I would stop and I say, all right, everybody, here's what I want you to do. I want you, I want you to make a list. And on that list, I want you to put down every area of your life that you know God wants you to change. It's an area that you need to grow in, but you're not growing. Let's just take something simple. Let's just say that you never read the scriptures. I get up in the morning. When my wife gets up in the morning, first thing that we do every morning is that we go read our Bible. She might she reads her Bible longer than I do. I probably read anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. She might read for two hours when she gets up to read. It, we, it's a habit. We, we do it every day. We get up, we read the Bible. But let's say that you don't, that you hardly ever read the Bible. The only time you open the Bible is when you come to church. God wants you to change that, right? That's, a, that's some dirty clothes. God wants you to put that off if you can think of it in that way. And so God wants to confront you with the obvious dirty areas of your life that you need to put off. Why do you want to put them off? You won't grow. Right. But you want to put them off so that you can put something else on. Right? I don't walk around the house naked. Right? When I take off, when I, at the end of the day, when I take my clothes off, I put some other clothes on. Right? So you take it off so that you can put something else on. That ought to be obvious and, and clear to us. Uh, so you have to allow the Word of God to confront you. You have to allow the Word of God to make you, to, you have to allow it to make you uncomfortable when you read it. And what happens generally is that when we get to one of those uncomfortable places, what do we do? We just read through it really fast. Or maybe we go to the other chapter. We, uh, I know this is going to talk about this, and I don't, I'm not ready for that today, so i got to get up and go to work, so I'm not going to read that. That's what God really wants you to read, is the parts that really do make you uncomfortable. That's where he's really speaking to you. Uh, so when you read God's Word, you have to let it challenge you and change you. Here's key principle number 27. I think it's on the on your list there. Key principle 27, I'll go slow. You can never become what God wants you to become. You can never become what God wants you to become by remaining like you currently are. By remaining like you currently are. I've been a Christian for 51 years and I can tell you that I am not satisfied remaining like I am. I have to be willing to change. So let me say it in a different way. Let me take that principle and let me say it to you in a different way. I'll take my time as I go through this. You can never grow spiritually. You can never grow spiritually. You want to write this down. You can never grow spiritually without changing what needs to change in your life. You can never grow spiritually without changing what needs to change in your life. Just think about it for a minute. That's, some, that's one of the problems that so many Christians have is that they're no different today than they were 10 years ago. Not much has really changed in their life. They just haven't grown. They're, they're the same. If, 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 if you're going to grow spiritually, then something has to change. It always has to be changing. If all that you want to do is simply coast on into eternal life, then you probably will. Just want to coast? If that's the way you want to live out the rest of your Christian life, you just coast right on into to heaven, right? you, that's probably what, exactly what will happen. I want you to listen very carefully. I want you to listen very carefully. Write this down. If you never allow the Word of God to confront you, 
if you never allow the word of God to confront you, then it will never change you. Then it will never change you. I've heard it said, I think this is true, that change is hard in the beginning. It's kind of messy in the middle. And it's amazing at the end. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. This has been our mantra since the first message that we preached uh, three months ago. Change your thinking. Change your life. Change the way that you think. One of the foundations of the Christian life, one of the things that we want to do as we go through this series is that we want to learn specifically how it is that God changes us. I, I, I was sharing with uh, Larry the East the other night. We were talking on the phone uh, Thursday, Friday night. I think I guess it was Friday night. And I was sharing with him about some things that I've been learning. Um, and maybe it was with y'all as well on, on, on Thursday night about how God changes, what changes the brain, how you get the, the, your brain to grow. It's got protein, neurochemicals, and all kinds of things that are going on. You create these new neural pathways. Uh, we'll talk about all that later. But, um, you know, there are things that you can specifically do to, to change your brain, to change how you think. You have to build these, you have to build these pathways. And so I want to learn how God changes me. Here's what God is doing. I want to write this down. Here's what God is doing. What God is doing is always readjusting. God is always readjusting your thinking to his thinking. He's always, every day, every time I read the word, he said, I want you to think like this, Gary. This is how I want you to live, Gary. This is what I want you to do, Gary. This is how I want you to think, Gary. He's always readjusting your thinking to be like his. It would do you well to begin to embrace everything that you know that God wants you to change. Now, I want to give you I want you to turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, just a little bit to the right of where you are. And I want you to, I want you to read what Paul said to his very godly disciple and protege, Timothy, in chapter 6. And verse 11. Now pay attention to the verbs. The verbs are critical. The tense of the verb, the mood of the verb, all that kind of stuff. It, it's very, very critical. He says, but you, O man of God, he calls him a man of God. Okay, so let's just say that we know that he's talking specifically to Timothy here, but the application is for you. The application is for me. So I would read this way. But you, Gary... Flee, verse 11, flee these things. Um, he's, 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 he's talked about error and greed and wranglings and corrupt minds and people destitute of the truth and uh, contentment and all those kind of things. And he says, uh, he says, and there's some evil things and love of money. And he says, uh, he said, Timothy, I want you to flee these things and I want you to pursue something. I want you to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. So here's what he's saying to Timothy. I can read into it what he's, he's really saying to Timothy here. He says, Timothy, everybody listen, this is in terms that fit our study. When he says flee and pursue, he says, Timothy, you have to keep changing. You're a great guy. You've been following me around for 15 years. I've given you the Church of Ephesus. 
so that you can be its pastor. But you, there are going to be things in Ephesus that are bad, that are wrong, dirty clothes. You have to put them off. You don't want to put them on. You want to put on God's clothes, which are faith. He, he gives us here righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. He says, you cannot become content with where you are. Run. Flee. Always be pursuing God's best for your life and letting go of that which hinders you to do so. Here's what Paul told Timothy to do. He said, first, I want you to flee. You know what that means? It means to run away as quickly as you can from something that you know is wrong. If you read Proverbs on a daily basis, that's a good book to read on every day, one day for every uh, you know, 31 verses, you could read one a day. That's been a habit in my life for a long time. There's so many places in, in Proverbs that says, look, don't, don't meddle in somebody else's problem over here. You know, uh, you, you know, don't poke the bear in the eye. Just run from those things. Flee from those things as quickly as you can. Then secondly, he says, I want you to pursue, and that means to run as fast as you can, Toward that which is right. So if you see something that's wrong, Chris is our Chris is our resident detective. He knows all about this. When you see something that is wrong, run away from it. Get away from it if you know that it's wrong. And go pursue that which is right. That'll hold you in good stead. That'll keep you out of jail. If you'll be willing to do that. Both flee and pursue are present tense verbs. In, they're in the imperative mood, the active voice. The active voice means that you have to do it, right? The passive voice means that somebody is doing it to you. You know, the boy threw the ball, uh, or, or the boy hit the ball, that's the active voice. Uh, the, ball, the, the boy was hit by the ball, that's the passive voice. So in the active voice, you are to do it. And it's, in, and it's in the imperative mood, which means that it's a command. And that means that you're to always be doing this, running from and then running towards, putting off and putting on, letting go and clinging to, fleeing from and pursuing towards these different things. Listen, if you, if you never change anything, listen to me, if I look up here for a minute, if you never change anything, then nothing is going to change. How simple is that? <laughs> right? If you know something's wrong in your life and you don't change it, then nothing is going to change. That's just basic Christianity 101 for us. Please, 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 please do not make the fatal mistake of expecting everyone else to change. The scriptures, you have to see the scriptures as being written to who? You. you. Forget what somebody else needs to do. You know, I tell my students, look, just do what God wants you to do. Study to show yourself approved. Preach the word. Be in, instant in season and out of season. Just do what God wants you to do. Go. Make disciples. Just do it. That's what God wants you to do. So what invariably happens when somebody reads the list that we've read, they always see somebody else's fault. I mean, this happens all the time in marriage counseling. Well, if she would just change or if he would just do this and he's like that and she's like this. Listen, you do what God wants you to do. You let God take care of the other person. You can't change anybody. I can't change anybody. I can be an influence. I can make an impact in somebody's life, but I can't change them. I can't change you. I want to influence you. I want my life to impact you. But I can't change you. You have to make that decision. It's what? What's the key word? It's deliberate. It's intentional. That something has to change. If you recognize it, you know it has to change. Then go change it. I'll give you some help as we go through the series on how to do all of that. 
So you yeah. take care of your faults as revealed in these lists and don't worry about the faults that somebody else has. Gary. Yes, ma'am. Did you say uh, recently that it takes 66 days average to change a bad habit? No, no, no. I'll, I'll, Did you say that? No, I, I said, I said it the, opposite, the opposite of that. And we'll talk about the difference between a good, a good habit or a bad habit and your, your will. They're two different things. Your good habits are stronger than your will. In, in your brain, neurochemically, things that, that where you use your willpower, they get, depleted, they get depleted. They have to be replenished. But good habits, say like reading your Bible every day, which I, I do. I, I have a systematic way that I go through it. I mark it in my Bible. I've, I've been doing it for so many years. I don't know how many years I've been doing it. I've been, I, I've been doing it as long as I can remember. It's a habit. You, I, I'm not going to break it. I just get up. That's what I do. I don't even have to think about it. You know, it's like I take a shower the same way every day. I wash my hair the same way. I wash the right side. Tim told me the reason I wash on the right side first is because I'm right-handed. I said, well, wh which side do you do it? He's left-handed. He says he washes the right arm first. So if you're right-handed, left-handed, maybe you can... Well, I kind of made that up. <laughs> Is that what you Are you not listening? <laughs> I'm left-handed and I wash the right side. You do the right hands, right? So, but anyway, it takes, the research says that it takes 66 days to develop a good habit. 66. And most people don't have the willpower. <laughs> Uh, you know, just just sleep deprivation will keep uh, will affect your will. Stress will affect your your will. So stress, but it takes willpower first. Say that again. Willpower comes first. No, you don't. Well, you have to have the willpower. well, that's why most everybody breaks their New Year's resolutions. I told my wife when I got into the truck this morning at the house, I was putting her. She she's been driving. I can't drive yet, and she said, and I said, I'm making a New Year's resolution. I'm going to wash my truck this year. <laughs> I'm going to wash it this year. I live on a dirt road and it gets dirty too easy. And she says, well, I, we got to clean out the inside too. It's pretty clean on the inside, but it's... So that's my New Year's resolution. I'm going to wash my truck this year. That doesn't take a lot of willpower, but it takes, uh, it takes longer. It takes 66 days from research to develop a good habit. Uh, it takes 21 days, 21 days to break a bad habit. Yeah, that's so, there's a difference there. That was what really interested me. I thought it had been the reverse, but, but we'll, we'll go over some of that. That's, that's later down the road. So the point is, is that when you read the scriptures, a list like this, you don't want to worry about everybody else's faults. That, I think that will prove to be a total disaster. The, the moment that you begin to point out everybody else's problems and everybody else's faults, you're headed down a slippery slope. That's why I keep telling you, you have to see the scriptures as written to you. I mean, that's a principle. That's sort of a hermeneutical principle for anybody that's going to study the word. You change, you adjust, you do what God wants you to do. You change your thinking. You become a model of what it means to be a committed, a fully committed follower of Jesus Christ. You do that. And it will make an impact on people. It will have an influence on, on their life. Never attack another person's faults. <clears throat> they may have plenty, just don't attack it. Okay? You, you can maybe at some time talk about behavior, but don't attack, don't attack them. It's verses that we, like the ones we read here in Colossians chapter 3, in uh, Galatians chapter 5, and in 1 Timothy chapter 6, that God uses to stretch you. Right, they, you, if you, you could take all of those lists, you could combine them. You could, you could, you could write down all of those things. And said, all right, is, or is there anything in any one of these lists that applies to my life? If it is, what does God want you to do? What's the right biblical term? Put off, take off, get rid of. That's what God wants you to do. You have got to know that that's what God wants you to do before you'll ever do it. Remember, we talked about one of the principles on there is that you you can't. You can't confront a problem until you recognize that you have one, right? 
So uh, you, you have to determine if you actually believe those verses and that you're going to apply them to your life. Trust me, they do apply to you. They apply to me, everybody. But if you believe them, then you're going to apply those truths to your life. You'll, you'll begin to put off and to put on. Um, all right, I want to give you, I, I want you to know that God, that those scriptures are God's tool to stretch you. They're the, God, that's, that's God's tools to confront you and to challenge you and to change how you think so that you can change how you live. So here's key principle number 28. Key principle 28. Have I got it numbered right on the, yes. on the paper? Key principle 28 is that God's word always reveals what is right about your life and what is wrong about your life. God's word always reveals what is right about your life and what is wrong about your life. Don't fight it. Accept it. Believe it. Trust it. Change it. Put it off. Put it on. Whatever God wants you to do. So God's word always reveals what's right about your life and what is wrong about your life. So what does that mean for you? It means that to be successful as a Christian, here's what you have to do. To be successful as a Christian, you must accept God's assessment of what is right and what is wrong. If God says that anger is wrong, if God says that anger is wrong or if that bitterness is wrong or that is unforgiveness is wrong, you have to accept that, right? It's not like you can be bitter, I mean, nice to 99 people and bitter to just one person. Well, I don't, I don't really like them. I, I, you know, they said something to me. It was ugly. I didn't like it. Uh, they should never talk to me that way. And you get bitter, you get angry, you get frustrated, you get irritated. Now, God says, put it off. It'll do you good, right? You have to accept that. You have to accept God's assessment. If you don't accept his assessment, I think it means that you don't believe his word. Or you're not interested in being a follower of Christ. If you consistently, let's say you consistently have negative traits in your life, I think that you can be assured, unfortunately, that you know that you have them. If I gave you a, a, a piece of paper and a pencil and I said, write down all the, the, the faults in your life, you know what you do? You, you're starting to write something down, right? You say, well, this, this, this probably needs to change and this needs to change and I need to change that and this would be a good thing. I think that's what God wants me to do. I can assure you some of the things that we read about being angry and using filthy language. That's not how God wants you to live. Right? It's right here between your ears. It's how you think. God doesn't want me to live that way. I'm not going to live that way. I'm not going to be an angry person. I'm not going to have filthy language in my mouth. In fact, that's the exact opposite of how God wants you to live, right? If you saw somebody and they cursed all the time and they, they using God's name in vain, you would say, that's not what God wants. So if you can see it in somebody else, you can certainly see it in yourself. And you should. That's what God wants you to do. I've always heard it said, and I believe this is certainly true. You've heard it said, I, I know that this is not new to you, but this is, I've heard this said my whole Christian life that sin will always take you further than you want to go. It will always take you further than you want to go. It will always keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will always cost you more than you want to pay. We just had a story of a young man, I say young man, middle-aged man, that in his mind became addicted. And then he became addicted physically. And today he's dead. He's dead. That, that, he didn't want to go there. It cost him more than he really wanted to pay. And so if for some reason this describes your life, then you have to develop a new mindset, a new neural pathway. And God has given you the power, the supernatural power, to do just that. I, I wouldn't be teaching this series 
if I didn't believe that there were things there, if, if everybody here was just perfect, we, you know, we, we got it all keyed up 100%, we, we're living a Christian life, there's nothing to change, I wouldn't be doing this. This is, this is for me, this is for you, because there are things in our life that we, that we have to change. You have to recognize where you are spiritually, and I think this is the key word, I think I've used it often, you have to cultivate how God wants you to think, right? You have to cultivate it. Uh, I go out to my garden, I clean it out, I put fertilizer on it, I plow it up, uh, get all the weeds out, you know, rake it out. I cultivate it, we plant the seeds. And then things begin to grow. I want you to go to Philippians chapter 2. Turn back. Philippians chapter 2. I want to read verse 5. This is, that's what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2. He said, let this mind be in who? In you. So just put your name there. He's talking to all the Philippians and everybody else that read the letter and people like us. He said, let this mind be in you, Gary, which was also in uh, that little conjunction that there is, is, uh, is that a preposition or a conjunction? Conjunction. Uh, yeah, preposition. That little preposition is really a very critical word in the New Testament. It is the Greek word en. It can be translated 50 different ways, but I think they got it right. God, the Son, or the Son of God, had a mind, and in that mind, he had the right things. He thought the right way. And God says, I want you to have the same, I want you to think the same way that Jesus thought. The, the Greek interlinear, if you just were to look it up in the Greek text, it says, let this thinking be in you. That this thinking, this way that you think, let this be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so the question is really very simple. You come, let's say that you come to a very difficult circumstance in your life. You, maybe you're frustrated, you're with somebody. Maybe you're in Walmart, right? <laughs> Wally World. And you're in line, and you're at the back of the line, and everybody's got a full cart, and you've got three items. And you start to get frustrated. You know, Walmart needs to get more checkers. They need to have more of these places open. And I don't like to go down there where I've got to do it myself. They're paying me to bag up my groceries. That's a mindset, right? That, that's a mindset. It, it's, it's the way that somebody thinks. You, it happens all the time. If you go down to Walmart. So how would God, how would Christ... Want me to respond to that? We were in Aldi last. Was it Aldi last night? Went to Aldi last night, and uh, there was a lady had a. You know, Aldi, I love the way Aldi does it. You you have to put up your buggy to get the quarterback. You go in. You 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 you, you know they got you, you got to have your own bags. You go put it in your in your truck. You come back. You put it in. You get your quarter. That kind of stuff. And so there was. And so they take uh, the previous buggy or your buggy, and they turn it to the side, and the lady puts all the food in there. She doesn't back in there. She's just swiping stuff across there, and it's going ding, 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 ding. And so there was a lady behind us that had a lot of groceries, and we, we didn't have a lot, but we had some. And there was a guy that came up behind her. He had, some, he had a, a little bouquet of flowers that he was going to obviously give to somebody that he cared a lot about. And so... The lady says, hey, you go ahead of us. And he's, I'm, I got my back turned to the guy, you know. But I could hear this going on in the back. And she, and she said, no, 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 you go ahead of us. And he said, no, 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 it's, it's okay. He said, no, 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 you go ahead of us. So he, he come back. And so he's standing behind me. Boy, what do you, what do you think I got to do? <laughs> I turned around. I said, hey, come on through. He said, no, 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 I don't have to. I said, come on through, buddy. 
And so he went up and he paid for his flowers and then we started. That's the kind of thinking. That's good thinking, right? You know how many times he thanked us? Three times. Three times the guy thanked us for letting us let him come through and, and check out early. So how does God, how does Christ want me to respond to any situation, especially the difficult ones? It's a simple question, but we've muddied the waters. We've, we've made everything so complicated. I've told you, I think one of the principles is there is that God's wisdom is never complicated. I don't know which one it was or which lesson it was. It's never complicated. If you're a thief, you have to stop stealing, right? If you got on the wrong clothes, you had to put on the right clothes. There's nothing complicated about what we're talking about. We have determined in our Christian culture that we can ignore what God says, do what we want, and then say a little prayer and everything is going to work out for us. That's not true. What is that called? Come on, somebody tell me. That's a lie. That's a lie. The enemy has deceived you. That you can live how you want to. You can do whatever you want to. You can talk any way you want to. You ignore what God says and everything's going to work out for you. Nope, 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 nope. Wrong landing zone. Yeah, long, wrong landing zone. The trajectory of your life is going to land over there. Right? That's, a, that's an illusion. That's a crazy twisted pipe dream that is a lie from the enemy that's exactly how he wants you to think though and that's exactly how he controls your life it's getting you to believe his lies that's all he wants to do he wants you to believe his lie i have a whole section on uh when we get toward the end of the study on on how to overcome his lies how to overcome the deception uh, so just hang in, hang on till we get there. So in order to combat the lies of the devil, the Bible calls them schemes and wiles and deceits. You have to develop the correct mindset, the correct spiritual mindset that God wants you to have. You remember when I talked about my wife's voice? I can recognize my wife's voice anywhere. On the phone, I can be in Romania, Indonesia, I can talk to her. I recognize her voice. I know her voice. I know what she sounds like. And the more time that you spend in God's Word, the more that you're going to understand. My sheep hear my voice. This is His voice to you. Somebody says, uh, if you want God to speak audibly to you, just read the Scriptures aloud, right? Just read it aloud. That's, that's God speaking to you. And so, um, you have to develop the correct mindset that God wants you to have. Remember that a mindset, a spiritual mindset, is something that you want to, it's ongoing, it's permanent. It's a permanent way of thinking that's always the exact opposite of what we call a carnal mindset. Remember, we looked in 1 Corinthians of a carnal mindset, of a worldly mindset. Colossians 3, 8, 10, 3, 8 and 10 is a starting point. That's the first passage that we read here this morning. It's a starting point for you. It's sort of a foundation for knowing how God thinks. If God tells you to put off something, it's because he knows that what you do not put off will eventually bring great harm to your life. That's what God knows. He's a lot smarter than us. And He knows that if He tells me to, it's like, don't, when your kids were growing up, don't get near the road. Why'd you tell them, don't get near the road? Because you know that they got near the road that there was a good chance that they could get run over. They don't know the danger. They don't see the danger. We're, just, we're no different than the children. We think, no, I don't have to put that off. Yes, you do. That's the message here. I'm not making any of this up. It's inevitable. You can never, here's, a, here's the principle. Everybody write this down. This may be the most important thing that I say to you all morning. 
You can never do the wrong thing. You can never do the wrong thing and get the right results. You can never do the wrong thing and get the right result. That's the border that's borderline insanity. It's the mark of somebody who does not think like God thinks and somebody who thinks very foolishly. Likewise, if God tells you to put something on, right? He told you to put something off. He told you to put something on. If he tells you to put on certain attributes, it's because he knows that when you put those qualities on in your life, that they will bring great blessing to you personally. And they will bring great blessing to those people that surround your life. Your friends, your family, your children, just put them on. Put them on. Be what God wants you to be. Live like how God wants you to live. It will be a great blessing to you, a great blessing to your family, to your friends. God knows that when you do the right thing, that you will get the right result. He knows that if you do the wrong thing, you will get the wrong result. Now, I want you to turn with, in, uh, to Romans chapter 13. And what I want to do, these are, just, these are just examples. What I want to do is I want to read you three passages. I had more, but I'm only going to read three. Of what God wants you to put on, attributes. These are not lists. One of them has a list, but this is... These are the attributes that God wants you to put on. These are the qualities. These are the clean clothes. These are God's clothes that he wants you to put on. Romans chapter 13 and verse 12 says, The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us, let all of us, Gary, James, Brenda, Casey, Larry, Bonnie, all of us, let us all put on the, uh, the armor of light. It's kind of interesting. I don't know what your translation says, but in the Greek interlinear, I love the way that it's translated in the interlinear. It says that I want you to put on the weapons of the light. It's different than just the armor. I want you to, I want you to put on the weapon of light of truth think of it as arm, arming your life with truth you put on and you apply god's truth to your life that's what he's telling us to do here go to romans chapter 13 verse 14 he tells us he says but put on the lord jesus christ you put on his truth and the way that you, 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 you put on Christ is you put on his attributes in your life. You make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Uh, you honor Christ, you exalt Christ, you extol Christ, you revere Christ, you elevate Christ. You always put Christ first in your life. You always do that. You always are lifting him up. You always want to put Jesus Christ on display and you cannot do that if you have not taken off your dirty clothes Amen. you can't do it think of christ as the absolute finest of god's clothes mm. that he wants you to wear and then put on christ and wear christ and display christ in everything that you do, every word, every act, every attitude that you have, every thought, do not settle for less. I love the verse. It's making so much sense to me as I studied through this, is to bring every thought captive. You know how many thoughts you have in a day? I don't, I don't know if I remember the exact number. You have about 22,000 different thoughts every day. And he wants you to bring all of those into captivity. It's a mindset, right? I'm going to think like God thinks. If something happens in your life, you know it's not what God wants you to do, you just run away from it. You just literally run away from what you know is not right. 
But you go back to Colossians chapter 3 or to your right. You know how I remember this, don't you? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Gary eats what? Popcorn. Gary eats popcorn. I, 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 I'm living that my whole life here. It helps me. Colossians 3, verse 12 and 14, 12 through 14, is a very important list. It's a list here. It tells you exactly how God wants you to think when difficult moments happen in your life. Let's read it together. It says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, now, in the Greek, I could literally, if I was translating this, I could put the word you. And that's the way that you should do it. So I would say, therefore, is the elect of God, holy and beloved, Gary. Put on. Uh, tender mercies in, in the uh, in, in the interlinear it calls it bowels of compassion put on bowels of compassion kindness humility meekness long suffering bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another even as Christ forgave you so you Gary almost must do this is what you have to do. I looked up the word uh, uh, meekness. It's the word, it's a Greek word, protes. That's an unimportant, but the word meekness means that you accept God's dealings in your life as good. God begins to work on your life. He wants to change something in your life. And what you want to do is that you want to say, that's a good thing, Father. I want to integrate that. I want to implement that into my life you see the work of God in your life is something that is very good and you don't resist it you don't dispute it that's a very important word and then he says above all these things Gary you put on love which is the bond of perfection these these verses are God's list for helping you to evaluate where your Christian life really is. You ought to read this and you ought to, you ought to be able to ask yourself, am I a compassionate person or am I a critical person? Am I all time talking about somebody behind their back? We have a guy that uh, James and I pray with every Tuesday and Friday morning, uh, Eddie. And I, we, I kid around him uh, with him all the time. Uh, and I said, I'm never going to tell you anything nice to your face. You're just kidding. I said, but I do say nice things about you behind your back. I do say nice things about you behind your back. And I do. So, being kind, being humble, being meek, long-suffering, forbearing, forgiving, loving, that's just what God wants you to put on. That, that's his clothes, right? Are you wearing those? You have to build a pathway, a newer pathway, and reinforce it with the right thinking to achieve this. Let us assume, let us just make an assumption that you know that you are inevitably going to be confronted with a difficult circumstance. Maybe it's something at work, maybe it's something in your family, maybe it's with one of your kids, maybe it's with a coworker, uh, and you know that what's going to happen is going to be very, very difficult. It's going to be a difficult circumstance that you're going to have to face. It, it could be a relational problem. It could be a marriage issue. It could be a financial difficulty. Whatever it is, you know that it's going to test your patience. It's going to protest, uh, test your endurance and your resolve to respond to it in the way that God wants you to respond. Okay, I'm going to give you a principle here. This is principle number 29. I want you to listen very, very carefully, and then I'll talk about it, what you have to do, all right? What you have to do. You have to, this is the principle, pre-decide, that's the key word, predetermine, predecide pre-decide how God wants you to respond 
predetermine how God wants you to respond to a difficult situation or a difficult circumstance before it ever happens. Well, I know I'm going to be in this meeting today and it's going to really be ugly. Well, how are you going to respond? How does God want you to respond in it? Just make a determination as to how you are going to respond. I know how I'm going to respond when somebody wants to make me angry. I don't even have to think about it. You know, Proverbs says, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. It says a soft answer turns away wrath or anger. I know what I'm going to do. I know how I'm going to respond to it. I know what I have to walk away from. If, if that was the case, hopefully it wouldn't be. But if you know that you're likely to find yourself in a difficult and uncomfortable circumstance, you have to predetermine in advance before it ever happens, it will happen. You want to know beforehand exactly how you're going to respond. And it's not going to be with ungodly words. It's not going to be with an ungodly, unchristlike attitude and behavior. It's not going to be with uh, uh, just the kind of spirit that does not reflect Christ. Because God has done what? Why are you not going to do it that way? Somebody tell me. <laughs> That's true. I'm looking for the biblical terms that we have used this morning. God wants you to put off. Put it off. Put it off. Don't do it. Don't talk that way. Don't act that way. Don't live that way. Put it off. Take off the dirty clothes and put on the clean clothes. You settle that before anything ever happens. Let's say there's somebody that you work with and you don't get along with them. You, you have to determine beforehand. The day, you, you, you have to know when you go into that circumstance how you're going to respond. It's super critical to your thinking process that you determine beforehand how you're going to respond to difficult moments. You will have them. Trials and struggles will come. Let me read you a verse. Let me read you a couple verses. Why don't you turn there? Turn to Proverbs chapter 25. I love Proverbs because everything, these, these little pithy statements that... Um, Proverbs 25, verse 28. This is a great verse. And I'll give you another one. Proverbs 25, 28. Eight. I'll wait till you get there. It's the last verse. God says, whoever has no rule over his own spirit, he can't, he doesn't have any self-control. He just speaks his mind. He says what he wants to. If he wants to use a curse word, he'll cut that. He has no rule over his own spirit. This is what God says that you're like, if that, if that identifies you. You're like a city. You know, back then when they wrote this, they would go, they'd build a city and they'd build these walls around it. And they'd have watchtowers on it, you know. Uh, uh, you, you had to be careful if you were on the watchtower that you didn't fall asleep, right? But if you have no rule over your own spirit, it's like a city broken down. It doesn't have any walls. It's without walls. Self-control. Self-control is your pathway to spiritual freedom. Self-control is your pathway to spiritual freedom. Why? It's because self-control self allows you, it allows you to do what's right even when you don't want to do what's right. You want to say something. You want to respond back. You want to speak your mind. But self-control will encourage you not to do that. Control is not the issue. Surrender is the issue. Surrender produces freedom. Self-control is much easier when you mentally decide that you will surrender your will to God's will when a conflict raises its ugly head. 
Go back to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. It's a great verse. This is a great verse if you struggle with anger. It says in verse 32, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. You could be the commander of a great army and take a city. But if you're an angry person and you don't rule your spirit, God says you're stronger than that person if you do. Let, let, let us assume that you're somebody who chooses to live for yourself and you always do what it takes to get what you want. Have you ever met anybody like that? They're going to have their way. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what you think. They're going to do it their way. It's my way or the highway. And no matter how things develop, they're always going to say what they want to say. That person has no self-control. That kind of person, they're like a city with a broken, with the walls broken down. They have no self-control. If that describes you, then you will become a very lonely person. When you choose your will over God's will, I'm going to give you the results of it. And I can prove this to you scripturally. I'm not going to try to do it today. But it, when you choose your will over God's will, it will leave you empty, disappointed, frustrated, and discouraged. When you choose your will over God's will, it will leave you Empty, disappointed, frustrated, and discouraged. Romans chapter 1, if you understand anything about it, you ought to. Romans chapter 1 confirms that the worst thing God can do to you is to give you what you want. It says three times that God gave them over to do what they wanted to do. And until you learn that lesson, you will always find that you being self-centered is your worst enemy. You being self-centered is your worst enemy. Let's assume that you have to deal with somebody who is consistently rude and abrasive. You know that they're rude and abrasive. Uh, you deal with them every day. It could be somebody in your family. Uh, it could be somebody that you work with. It could be anybody. And you know that the next time that you talk to them, get into a conversation with them, that they're going to say something to you. It's going to be abrasive. It's going to be ugly. You're not going to enjoy it. I've told you the story about the, uh, the man that uh, when we went to Town Creek, uh, uh, you know, 30 years ago, uh, he, he, was, he never said anything. I mean, for years, he never said anything nice to me, ever. He didn't like me. He never said anything Every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, I would go up to him and I would hug him and I would tell him that I loved him. He'd say something ugly to me. He'd say something ugly about my wife. He'd say, I'd say, huh? I'd say, man, I love your children. They're just great. He said, oh, well, you're, you need to work on your children. I mean, I'm really, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not making any of this up. You can ask my wife. It's like, Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'll try this next week and see how it works. And one day they had an evangelist that came to Town Creek, and and uh, at the end, he Bailey Smith, he was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention at the time, and had a church out in Oklahoma City, the largest church at that time. And he gave an invitation, and, and there were just there were about 25 people that went down. I'll, I'll never forget this. I will never forget this. And this guy got up out of his seat and went down as a deacon in the church. First time in his life, he gave his life to Christ. And he turned around, went down to the aisle, came down to my seat. I'm sitting on the side. He grabs me and hugs me. He says, thank you for loving me 
for so long when I was so unlovable. <coughs> he says, you've been showing me Christ for years. You've been showing me what it means to be a Christian for years. And I rejected it. He said, thank you for loving me. You never know. You never know the impact that you're having on somebody's life. If you're wearing dirty clothes, I can assure you that it's not a good impact. What do you do when you know you're going to be around somebody rude and abrasive? You go to God's Word, you find out exactly how God would want you to respond. Don't miss what I just said. You go to God's Word, you find out how God wants you to respond to a difficult situation, and you determine in your heart and in your mind that that's what I am going to do. You find out from Scripture exactly what God wants you, how God wants you to respond to a trial. You always, men and women, you always put God's Word and God's honor above your own feelings. You always put His Word above what you want to do and how you want to do it. You may not feel too loving to, towards somebody, but that doesn't mean that you have the green light to be unloving. That would be sin, actually. Here's what you do. Here's what you do. You predetermine. You predetermine that you're going to be kind to that person. Now, you're going to say something edifying to them. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. You determine beforehand that you're going to edify them. You make that simple choice before anything ever happens. You, you make that decision beforehand. That's what God wants you to do. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Let me read it a different way. Gary, Gary, do not let any corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but Gary, you speak what is good for necessary edification, that your words, Gary, may impart grace to the hearers. That's exactly how you want, God wants you to think. This happens before the trial. This happens before the struggle. This happens before the stress raises its ugly head. You already know how God wants you to respond. You could be dealing with somebody that's angry all the time, lazy, hurtful, selfish, dishonest. It could be any kind of negative attribute in their life. If you do not predetermine how you're going to respond before something happens, then you will invariably respond the exact opposite way that God wants you to respond. Your default position will be your flesh. That doesn't work. You have to decide beforehand how you will respond to trials and struggles that you know you're facing. facing. The way that we've said it all through this study is that you make your decisions and then your decisions make you. Right? Your life today is a byproduct of the decisions that you want to make. They make you. You learn how God thinks, and then you make it the goal of your life to think the same way. You have to, what's the title of this series? You have to connect your mind with your life. I've I got to make the connection. I have to think the way that God wants me to think. So what happens when you violate verses like this? What is that saying about you? It's saying that you don't care about God's word. You're thinking to yourself, I know somebody's thinking, I mean, there are a lot of people that listen to these videos and 
people in other parts of the world and they somebody's thinking Gary you have no idea what I'm going through in my life I, yes I do oh yes I do I've been a pastor for a long time I know exactly what people are going through the difficulties that they're having and you thinking to yourself, you have no idea why I lost my temper or said something ugly. No, no, no. If somebody's going to tell me no one is perfect. I want you to listen very carefully. I want you to listen very, very carefully to what I'm going to say to you. I want what I'm going to say to be your neural pathway, to be your mindset, to be the way that you think because it's the way God wants you to think. When you come up against these difficult situations, your excuses are nothing more than your personal justification as to why you believe that you are exempt from obeying God's word. I'm not exempt. My wife's not exempt. Our two elders are not exempt. You're not exempt. Our associate pastor is not exempt. Your children are not exempt. Where does God give anybody? If, if you could tell me in the scriptures, where does God give anyone an exemption from obeying him? I'm grateful that he's forgiving, right? Everybody say, right. I'm really grateful that he's very forgiving. But until you have that mindset that you're going to obey God, you will continue to become angry. You're going to say hurtful words and have bad feelings towards somebody else. Stated a different way, it's like you're not really serious about being a Christian. You're more satisfied with living how you want to live than how God wants you to live. I want to give you principle number 30 and we will close. Key principle number 30, it's written down there in the notes I've passed out. God's truth is always confrontational to the person who does not want to obey it. If you don't want to obey it, it's always going to be confrontational to you. If you want to obey it, you will embrace it. You will embrace what God has to say. You say, God, that's what I want to do. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to curse. I don't want to. I don't want to be bitter. I want to be forgiving. I want to care about people. I want to be kind. I want to say nice things. So, what have we addressed today? What are our key points of this study? Number one, I'm just going to read these very quickly, and I'll, you'll be. I'll be through. I know I'm, I'm long-winded, right? Sorry for Bill and Annette and Donna. <laughs> My church is used to it, so. You must allow the Word of God to confront you and to make you uncomfortable when you read it. Number two, key principle 27. You can never become what God wants you to become by remaining like you currently are. Number three, you never allow the Word of God to confront you, then it will never change you. Number four, what God is doing is always readjusting your thinking to His thinking. Key principle 28. God's Word always reveals what is right about your life and what is wrong about your life. Number six, because of that, you must accept God's assessment of what is right and what is wrong. Number seven, you can never do the wrong thing and get the right result. Key principle 29, pre-decide, predetermine how God wants you to respond to a difficult circumstance before it ever happens. Number nine, self-control is your path to spiritual freedom. Number 10, you being self-centered is your worst enemy. Number 11, you always put God's word and God's honor before your feelings. And number 29, number 12, key principle 30, God's truth is always confrontational to the person who does not want to obey it. Hmm. Any questions or comments for me? What? I want to thank our visitors for enduring today. <laughs> Yes.